Okay, so welcome. We are in part six of People Are Complicated. And uh, we're looking at uh, 1 Samuel 18, 17 through 30. There's a typo in the very first. Oh, part there. Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay, so um, as we've been doing, I'm going to read the text out loud. And as I do that, I just uh, encourage you to highlight, underline, note what grabs your attention, and, and we will start with that question, what, what do you notice? There, there are never any wrong answers there. So 1 Samuel 18, verse 17. Then Saul said to David, here is my elder daughter, Mary. I'll give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines deal with him. David said to Saul, who am I? And who are my kinsfolk, my father's family, Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But at the time when Saul's daughter Mary should have been given to David, she was given to Adriel, the, the Maholophite, as a wife. Now, Saul's daughter, Michael, loved David. Saul was told, and the thing pleased him. Saul thought, let me give her to him, that she may be a snare for him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall now be my son-in-law. Saul commanded his servants, speak to David in private and say, see, the king is delighted with you, and all his servants love you. Now then, become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants reported these words to David in private. <clears throat> and David said, Does it seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and of no repute? The servants of Saul told him. This is what David said. Then Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desires no marriage present except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, that he may be avenged on the king's enemies. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When his servant told David these words, <coughs> David was well pleased to be the king's son-in-law. Before the time had expired, David rose and went along with his men and killed 100. That's the Septuagint translation. Uh, the Hebrew text has 200. He killed 200 of the Philistines. And David's king and, and David brought their foreskins, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. Saul gave him his daughter, Michael, as a wife. But when Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that Saul's daughter, Michael, loved him, Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy from that time forward. Then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle. And as often as they came out, David had more success than all the servants of Saul, so that his fame became very great. What, what do you notice? What stands out to you? I was pretty lucky with my father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't ask much of me. <laughs> Only 50 Philistines. <laughs> I had most the parallel that David did with Uriah. David. You know, and it, yeah. That, I just had never saw the connection. Mm. Yeah. But but let the internet speak to with Uriah. Yeah. You want to get rid of somebody, just send them out to war. <laughs> what else? What stands out to you? What do you notice? Foreskins, I guess it's a lot like scalping Indians. You know, kind of sounds like it does. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Very brutal either way. Oof. I guess that's the yeah. thing that was done. War is a horrible thing. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> what else? 
One of the things that I notice is is the repetition of of son in law, yeah. and and you know I just not sure what that's supposed to mean. Meaning that it, does a son in law have the same rights as a, um, a son or or a daughter for that matter? And because it's in law, can that? And I don't know yeah. the time that this occurred whether or not that could get undone. So. You know, I don't know if there were things like divorce and therefore it was no longer in law and therefore any privilege that might have came as a result of being part of the family, being a son in law meant anything. But it's repeated, you know, quite often in the text. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's, that's a good noticing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting. What are, what are the uh, the rules of succession, royal succession here in, in ancient Israel? How does that work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, with some some points of tension on page twenty two. Um, so twice we have women given to men as objects, and they they really don't seem to have any agency of their own. I mean, Michael loves a bit, but she's given. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Merib's given, but in the end, not to David. Yeah, but she doesn't appear she wanted to be to David necessarily, you know. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, a little mystery, thought, yeah, it's, a little, it's definitely a mystery. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a mystery. Doesn't say she loved, you know, clears clears the deck for you know for for Michael to do the you know for the love story. Yeah, the, I mean it's, there seems yeah. to have been some kind of um deadline that was um, 19, but at the time when Saul's daughter Mary should yeah. have been given to David. Right. There was some sort of something, deadline. Something passed. happened. Uh, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, there's certainly no mention of since they wanted to marry them, he blessed their marriage. Right. Since, yeah. Yeah, there was no, yeah, they don't, there is, didn't have autonomy. Daughters at poker chip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Merib finally fulfilled her lifelong dream. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, it seems strange that when, when you know, Saul finds out that Michael actually loves David, then it's somehow more threatening or, you know, that then he's more fearful. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of an yeah. interesting little twist there. It is, yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, another point of tension, uh, Saul uses people, his daughters, and then the Philistines to harm another person. So <clears throat> using people to hurt people. Um, so it's gone from throwing spears to throwing people to try to get David, um, which feels like an escalation. Uh, there, there's that tension there between David's humility. Who am I? Who are my kinsfolk? I'm a poor person. I have no repute. Uh, and, and then David's popularity. Everybody loves David. Mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. it's like, hmm, are you really are you really a person of no, no renown? Um, David and his men killing 100 Philistines or 200 Philistines and bringing their foreskins to Saul. Um, that's just sort of staggering. Mm -hmm. uh, some other things I noticed, just Saul realizes that the Lord is with David. We're told that again. We've seen that before. And so you know, that's part of the mix for Saul, that God's not with him. Saul's afraid. Like Julie pointed out fear. Fear seems to be one of the emotions that's motivating Saul to do really bad things. Um, I noticed the Philistines don't seem to be very good at warfare. Yeah. <laughs> no. Every time they go out, David beats them. It's right. just like, really? That's they just have that one guy. Oh, I am. <laughs> but he's David. He's like, yeah. he's part of the, uh, the Avengers or Not just something. anybody. Right. He has surprise. Yeah. Yes. But that... that to me, that lends the narrative sort of that that um, you know, the quality of a novel. Mm -hmm. you know, right. It's just you're know, thinking, well, what was the real story there? Okay, um, some some general uh, commentary and application here. So we might note that the offer of Merib is is the fulfillment, somewhat delayed, of a promise that Saul made earlier. So back in First Samuel seventeen twenty five. 
The Israelites said, have you seen this man who has come up of the line? Surely he's come up to defy Israel. The king will greatly enrich the man who kills him and will give him his daughter and make his family free in Israel. So, you know, already back in, in seven, first Samuel 17, Merib's being dangled here as the, you know, do the king's bidding, kill this Philistine, and you can get Merib. Mm -hmm. Um only a little twist here, Merib is really not being given because David um, uh, defeated Goliath. She's only going to be given if he'll go back out against the Philistines. So it, it feels a little bit like Saul's gone back in his word. Yeah, bait and switch. Yeah, bait and switch. Yeah. Uh, Walter Brueggemann, mm -hmm. this is 1B. At the beginning, verse 5, in the middle, verse 15, and at the end, verse 30 of the narrative, it is affirmed that David has success in everything. We're told twice that the Lord was with him, verse 12 to 14. And finally, even Saul sees and knows that the Lord is with David, verse 28. The convergence of the Lord was with him and success is closely reminiscent of the Joseph story uh, back in the latter part of uh, Genesis, where God is with him and he becomes successful at all he's doing. So both David and Joseph are presented as benefactors of an initial commitment on God's part before which the historical process must eventually yield. I mean, it's almost like it doesn't matter what gets thrown at these guys. They're going to they're gonna come out on time because, because the Lord is with them. Um, again, Brueggemann, the, the narrator builds the case on behalf of David and against Saul slowly and carefully. To show that on every front, God is keeping the promise to give the kingdom to this one after his own heart. In this account, David takes no initiatives. He doesn't assert himself or express any ambition. He only receives what is given. In the language of Gunn, another author, it's all gift mm -hmm. without grasping. David has received the submission of Jonathan, Saul's heir apparent. He is married to the king's daughter who loves him, which gives him legitimacy. He's the hero of the public. A new history has begun in this man by the power of God. The Goliath defeat is a factor in David's rise, but it's not sufficient explanation for his enormous success and popularity. The only explanation is that this is the Lord's doing. Yeah, go ahead. I, I want to insert in here how good an illustration all of this is of our main theme, mm. which how complicated people are complicated. Um, and, you know, we're, looking, we're getting down into the weeds, which I think really illustrates well that people mm -hmm. are complicated. And, that King, and, and how King David's stories reveal a real estate story after her complex selves. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, yeah, it's really yeah. playing itself out now. It, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a good ways. illustration of that. Yeah. Um, one one more quote here and then some questions. So this is page 23 at the top, Joyce Baldwin. The rise of David from shepherd lad to royal family, though less meteoric than that of Saul, was characterized by divine approval. The Lord was with David is the comment once more in verse 28. It was also characterized by popular approval. All Israel loved him. Already following his lead in war, all the tribes gladly gave him loyal allegiance. Such Solidarity behind David increased Saul's feeling of isolation and intensified his fear and insecurity. David had more to fear from Saul than from the Philistines, against whom he was outstandingly successful. Far from losing his life, he kept gaining honors. Okay, so um, let's let's sort of let's take this. We have these two phrases: the Lord was with them, and he had success. Uh, so, so in your experience, do the statements the Lord was with him, and he was successful in all things, necessarily go together? No. Okay. I guess An why. example of that would be Paul. Oh. And you know, if you think about what he suffered as a missionary, you know, going all over the world of you know Turkey and Greece and so forth, and many times he was flogged and stoned and run out of town and left for dead. Um, that didn't sound very successful. Mm -hmm. And the Lord was with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a good biblical example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Jesus himself would seem to be an example. Mm -hmm. On the yes. opposite end, when he was speaking, it reminded me of Paul when he was persecuting the Christian. He was successful at it. Yeah. Oh, was, uh, oh yes. that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's where I thought turned. you were going. Yeah. <laughs> he was successful. Um, hmm. So this is as close as we'll ever get to prosperity gospel in the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> It feels well, a little yeah, bit like it that. does. It does. It yes. does. It, 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 when the story fits, you know. But when we go to weigh the kings, uh, you know, they could be successful, but they just—it was either thumbs up or thumbs down, depending on the way the story's told. You know, because they're looking at it from one particular angle. Mm -hmm. But some of those kings were very successful. Mm -hmm. If you look at you know what they accomplished or what they built or what mm -hmm. they did, you know. Of them had long reigns and all sorts of things, but it was thumbs down or thumbs up, mm -hmm. mostly thumbs down. You talked earlier about the correlation with Joseph and his story. And in that story, I mean, Joseph wasn't always successful, but God had a plan and he brought about that plan. And so even though it seemed like different circumstances tried to thwart it, you know, um, but he was constantly working to bring about the plan and the deliverance of, of Joseph's whole family, mm -hmm. you know? So, so, so I don't, I don't know if, if he would, if David would be successful in all things, if he did something, uh, you know, horrible, which he did in the end and he was suffered and he lost the success. Mm -hmm. So maybe at this point he was following the plan. Too, as well, maybe. Yeah, he seems to be faithful, loyal, yeah, to God, mm -hmm. to the king. Yeah. Um, what uh, second question? What what have you experienced that could only be explained as God's work? Because that's the, one of the themes here in these first mm -hmm. quotes is that you know this this could have only happened because God was with him. Um have, have you ever experienced anything like that that you look at and say that only happened because God was with me mm -hmm. i might say everything that you're thankful for is is a result of god being with you mm -hmm. so you you don't have to isolate it to uh one one uh situation it's each and every day okay yeah. I, I would think um for myself uh i don't know how i don't know why but um i connect with kids I don't understand it, hmm. but I trust that God is doing some work through me, but I have no idea what the heck is happening. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, something, that, something that's so core, you know, you didn't put it there. Yeah, I can't explain it. Uh, uh, James. Speaking, <clears throat> speaking for myself, <clears throat> I had a, over 18 friends of mine are dead, you know, from dope shooting, and I would... Yeah. And I shot with these people. Mm. And I did more. They wouldn't want to be around me because I always always fill up the teaspoon. And um why am I here? Mm. You know, mm -hmm. I'm serious. Yeah. You know, why am I here? Mm. But the same mm -hmm. people are dead. I, wow. over 18. Yeah. I, I kid you not. Wow. And uh and I did what they did. Mm -hmm. I did more than what they did, and mm -hmm. cuckoo more than they were. Mm -hmm. well, don't be nineteen. <laughs> right. But um, so yeah. So you can look, you can look at that and say, "Well, the Lord is with me," but but you also ask why. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> but it may be just like we saw with David and Joseph that God has a plan. God has a plan to use you and to bless others through you. So that's what I would think. I'm still here because God yeah. has things he wants me to do. Yeah, I just think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Something pond in my heart. Yeah. We're going to sing an invitation song. <laughs> <laughs> what you saying? I said we need to sing an invitation song. <laughs> right. That's some good preaching right there. I mean, do you think that narrator says that because he was successful in all that he did, the Lord must have been with him. I mean, does the oh. narrator know for sure? Mm -hmm. How do they know? Mm -hmm. I might tell your story, but I, I could say the Lord was with you, but 
I don't really have any specific insight except that, you know. You succeeded. You succeeded, or or maybe, you know, we can say James <laughs> must have been a plan for James to do something because hmm. given the story, you know, it looks like something was with him. Something was with him. Like, wasn't mm -hmm. with other people. So you could definitely say the Lord was with him. I would offer that the Lord is with everyone. And so, you know, you really can't isolate that. And, you know, I, I, I just want to add that to this conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Up on you. you have one detractor. Yeah. <laughs> with whom the Lord is not. That's right. <laughs> um, let, let's look a little more deeply at David and Mary. Okay. So some quotes and some questions. David does not question Saul's motivation, but humbly denies his qualification for such a high marriage. Verse 18. The curious turn of the narrative, however, is that the marriage offered without explanation is also drawn, withdrawn without explanation. The offer and withdrawal perhaps reflect Saul's instability and his inability to think clearly or plan coherently in his rage. I think I think that's kind of interesting mm -hmm. uh, there to, to consider that he's he's just kind of off the rails. So mm -hmm. yeah, kill Goliath, you can have marriage. Oh no, oh no, you can't, no, you can't. If you want marriage, you, you gotta go kill the Philistines. Um, again, uh, Brigham, it's worth noting that the strategy of the marriage proposal sounds strangely anticipatory of David's successful disposal of Uriah. Even in such a dastardly undertaking, David can succeed in ways in which Saul did not. It's interesting. Saul, Saul was more successful in doing evil than, I mean, David was more successful in doing evil than Saul was. Because his his plan to use warfare to kill somebody mm -hmm. worked out. Mm -hmm. he, he got you right dead. Saul, Saul couldn't get David dead. But it didn't work out for him in the end. No. no. no, no. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Bergen. These circumstances clearly pose risks for both David's reputation and his well-being. Failure to perform his duties successfully, even once on the battlefield, would reduce or erase David's prestige and popularity. And perhaps even his own life. So you know that that might have been part of Saul's thinking as well. You know, if I send him out often enough, he's eventually going to lose, and people stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stop following. Him. Um, Baldwin, this is letter D. A historical precedent existed for David to accept conditions set by Saul for gaining entrance into the royal family. Jacob had once used work as an alternative to paying the customary bride price. Uh, bride price for a wife. So could David. Uh, so we, we see we see some examples in the Old Testament of oh, okay let's let's we'll go the regular uh, price for the bride and instead work for so many years or go go kill some Philistines. Um, a little historical note: Letter E, Merib is was given in marriage to Adriel of uh, Mahola. Uh, this this union produced five sons who were later killed by the Gibeonites as a lingering result of Saul's sin. So we go to all, all the way to 2 Samuel 21, and we find out that Merib's um, marriage to Adriel results in five sons, and they're all killed. Um, sort of tragic. Uh, Robert Bergman on the bottom, it's all envisioned that David would be facing a double threat. The hand of the Philistines and Michael herself, this is very interesting, who would be a snare to him? Michael, uh, Michael could be a snare. Uh, we're, we're sort of jumping into Michael. Sorry, that this this quote should go one down later. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold that off. Okay, I'm gonna come back to that quote and just stick with David and Mary. Um, so let's talk about David and Mary. Uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, what what seems admirable about Saul's plan to you? Maybe only in a devious way, and and why why did it fail multiple times here? That was clever. 
You're going to have to help us with that one, Chris. Yeah. Well, I'm just asking questions. Yeah. <laughs> That's a tough word, admirable. <laughs> you think it looks, it sounds like somebody has an answer to this one. Or a thought, anyway. I think, I, I wonder, um, as much as Saul knew that David was a coming king, uh, I wonder if there was part of Saul that saw himself going down the rabbit hole and he would still try to pull himself out, but it was so deep, dark, and dank that he couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I feel a little empathy for him mm -hmm. because I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are like that. Mm -hmm. We see it and we can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm... I'm curious if we were supposed to have a, or, you know, have a feel for who this person was or what might have been, what he might have gained or lost by having that um, relationship with the Adriel, Adriel person. Yeah, of, uh, of yeah. Mahola. You know, if we had a feel for that, I mean, we just read over the name, we have no picture yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. But in a lot of the stories, you're supposed to know, well, this was from Moab. This was from you know wherever, and and we we unfortunately we often you know lack that, but mm -hmm. but it would I mean obviously yeah. from from Samuel you know that it didn't turn out well for that you know but but maybe he was like looking for I mean my first thought was he was looking for a an ally to strengthen him Saul Saul, Saul was looking uh, for an ally to strengthen him so uh, instead of giving him to David who he definitely was uh, a rival. You know, maybe he changed his mind and reached out and tried to make an ally with a neighbor that that would, you know, mm -hmm. be on Saul's side and come to his aid. Yeah. And things like that. That's insightful. Yeah. 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 That, that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So how, how does how does that little mention there advance the, the, the story and the narrative and, and right. what we're supposed to learn from it? Yeah. That's a good question. Things that keeps hitting me is um, this is all a problem of Saul's making. It it mm. wasn't a problem. Yeah. I mean, having someone who was young and vigorous and successful in the world, I mean, he Saul should have been able to look at him and say, "This is, you know, bright young thing coming up, and and he is going to enhance us. It's going to make." Oh, Nation of Israel better. Yeah. Yeah. We're all going to work as a team together. It's going to be great. And the day, but Saul could only see him as a competitor, even though David doesn't appear to present himself as a mm. competitor. Um, he doesn't, he downplays his importance, you know, but, but yeah. And Saul, David seems to be very loyal. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, it seems like he's very loyal. And, but, but Saul, so this problem is probably Saul's making. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, even though God had anointed him, David as the, as the next king, who's who to say God didn't wouldn't have wanted it saw to last longer if he had behaved himself? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you know, he could have been a king for for, for years more, mm -hmm. and with knowing that Saul was going to be, I mean, that yeah. David was going to be the the next one. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's a that's a good insight. This, I mean, this whole crazy mess mm -hmm. is is oriented towards something that's not real mm -hmm. yeah it's not a problem yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so to me it's like sometimes we make problems with them mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. we just kind of yeah. look within ourselves mm -hmm. at times and go like mm -hmm. why am i doing this why am i doing mm -hmm. this you know why am i fighting with this mm -hmm. you know sometimes we fight about things that are yeah we should, except that we're scared <clears throat> Yeah, so there's where that fear goes. Yeah. Sounds like a wise therapist. Yeah. <laughs> it leads over. <laughs> um, how, how could Saul have used his daughters? That's the culture this way? today. So, yeah, so there was a cultural component to this, yeah. Not just the culture of the day, but the culture for days and days and days and days. Yeah. Only recently. Very maybe, maybe recently. Not the culture, yeah. Last year. In some places, right? Right. A century or two, maybe in some places, but mm -hmm. yeah. unfortunately, it's. 
You know, it's not Harold's a patriarch. It's it's not far from uh, a certain presidential candidate who said that he'd love to go out with his daughter. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, it's cultural, but hmm, it's still present. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we can see it echoes of that today. I mean, today also, if you look at England, mm -hmm. you know, they marry other royalty. So, mm -hmm. not yeah. that far-fetched. Right. I mean, look at what happened to him. You know, he married yeah. somebody that's not a royalty. Yeah. And little by little. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he really messed up that family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Mike. So let's let's talk about David and Michael, and I'm going to jump back up to the quote. Um, that begins at the bottom of 23. Okay. So this is Robert Irving. If Saul envisioned that David would be facing a double threat, the hand of the Philistines, verse 21, and Michael herself, who would be a snare to him. Michael could be a snare in two ways. First, she could motivate David to place his life at extreme risk in battle with Philistines. Second, she could corrupt some off the top of page 24. Everybody see that? Top mm -hmm. of page 24. Mm -hmm. Second, she could corrupt David spiritually. So this is the interesting part. The term translated as snare, I won't try the Hebrew there, is a theologically significant one. Used three times in the Torah to describe the dangers of idols and idol worship. Perhaps Saul was spiritually astute enough to recognize that in marriage, his daughters, Michael's, idolatrous inclinations which come out a bit in, in uh, uh, chapter 19, verse 13, which we'll get to, that her idolatrous inclinations could easily lead David astray, in which case David would become the Lord's enemy and come to a disastrous end. So it's like there, there's sort of layers mm -hmm. here to the, the madness right. possibly of, of Saul that, that perhaps Saul recognizes you know, Michael's uh, had, you know, she she has some space in her in her worldview for for idols, and if I can get her attached to David, you know maybe the Lord wouldn't be with him as much. Yeah, and sure. um, you know we could begin to cut cut away at him that way. So there's some madness and paranoia, but there's also some cleverness and astuteness. Yeah, and... yeah, oh. yeah. I mean, this is a good movie. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It goes. It sometimes goes hand in hand. Um, uh, so Walter Brueggemann, under number three, page 24, 23, Walter Brueggemann, the second report of an offer of a daughter by Saul, uh, by Saul, this time Michael, is very is a very different matter. The Michael connection has a future in David's story. Michael, like Jonathan, loved David. We're taken inside Saul's shrewd reasoning by the narrator. We're not told in verse, verses 17 through 19 how a marriage would increase David's risk in battle. In this case, however, the intended risk at the hands of the Philistines is spelled out. David appropriately and modestly announces himself unworthy of marriage to the king's daughter. Such an act of abasement plays well into Saul's schemes. It permits Saul to drive a higher bargain and ask a higher price. Saul responds to David with a requirement that the bride's prices must be 100 Philistine foreskins. David must kill 100 Philistines. David acted promptly and well ahead of the deadline, which must have been set you know, like the previous one with Merit, although we're not told of it. Verse 26 suggests that a time limit had been set before which David needed to produce the foreskins. Uh, David brings the required booty. Indeed, David brings 200 foreskins, twice the number. Saul keeps his word. The marriage is enacted. Surrounding this marriage is a great darkness of fear, fear <laughs> and destructiveness. Saul's plan to destroy David by his Philistine stratagem has failed, and Saul has left himself even more vulnerable. David is now his son-in-law with visible entitlement to power ensconced in the royal establishment. David's entitlement goes hand in hand with popular acclaim and with commitment of Jonathan David. I mean, his, his deck is stacked. Mm -hmm. Robert, Robert Arth, Alter, the David, uh, from the David story. Beyond this story, there's no indication that the Israelites had a custom of collecting the foreskins of the uncircumcised Philistines like scouts. Another author named Falkelman shrewdly notes that the foreskins are associated with impure sexuality, 
and conjectures, conjectures that by this condition, Saul wants to contaminate David, just as Saul is using his own daughter's sexuality as a lure to destroy David. So, you know, the thought there is, in his evil geniusness, Saul is thinking, well, let's, let's not just get David to kill some Philistines. Let's get him to cut off their foreskins, making himself, uh, you know, ritually impure. And, and there, thereby somehow um, harming his connection to God, perhaps in some way. Mm. Um, Jonathan Kirsch down at the bottom. When David's refusal was, was reported back to Saul, the king took the plea of poverty to mean that David was unable to come up with a suitable bride price. The dowry in reverse that a suitor was expected to pay his future father-in-law in ancient Israel. So Saul extricated David from his predicament by proposing a bride price that only required courage in battle, which David possessed in plenty and not a hoard of gold. And so Saul could be coming across here as the as the good guy. David, I know that you don't have much to your name. That's all right. Just go do what you, you do well already. Get out there and battle. Well, you know, add some force against that. Uh, if David took up the grotesque challenge or saw or so saw calculated, he would certainly die by the sword of some Philistine soldier who refused to be separated from his foreskin. <laughs> what else, after all, would better motivate a man in battle than the integrity of his own <laughs> genitalia? Amen. <laughs> Perhaps I should read that again. <laughs> yeah, which is an interesting, um, you know, uh, what if? What if? What if word got out among the Philistines? This guy David is. We better kill him. Right. Yeah, I, I would think that would be motivating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so questions. <laughs> Why, why do you think David went through with this challenge, given all the physical, spiritual, cultural barriers? Well, I was going to say first that, that it's interesting that that um, it says that there's no indication that this was a custom. Mm -hmm. You know, that's yeah. pretty unique. Yeah. So yeah. why would he not think at that point, this man's crazy? Yeah, right. You want me to what? <laughs> right. With I'm not who? doing that. Right. Huh? But, but it, maybe it's like would feel as crazy because circumcision was part of the of their culture. Um and you know, so you so you kill people and then you then you bring the foreskins home. Mm -hmm. And I, we're not saying right. that this was a live action, you know, thing. Right. Yeah, could this <laughs> be... Do you feel weird because circumcision is still very much part of all for our culture. I mean mm -hmm. Um, I mean, my son was circumcised, mm -hmm. and you know, on up through generations. I, I mean, it's pretty normal to still do that today, mm -hmm. but it's a totally different thing to do it to a grown man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially a dead one. Yeah, I assume a dead person. I hope so. Well, <laughs> I, don't yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just don't see. Yeah, I would think like the, it would still be odd. Yeah. Could it be like the 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 force of baptism of of, yeah, um, you exactly. know, Muslims in the Crusades or something. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 but I find that the fact that we don't have evidence of something not very persuasive because there's what evidence we have of much going on culturally at those. I mean, we really stretch sure. yeah. to figure yeah. out yeah. these yeah. things. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. There's there's a, a lot. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ancient history that we just don't know. Yeah, especially with the ancient time of Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. yeah, it's just a lot we don't know. So why why do you think David went through with all this? I mean, was was I don't know say that. because the king asked him to? Because he yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, to have a sense of God with him mm -hmm. on and off at least no. Mm -hmm. So he saw something of, of God in this destiny. <clears throat> destiny. Uh, yeah. He knows he's been anointed king. And I'm going to so. guess it's on and off that he forgets it and remembers it and forgets it and remembers it. But he, you know. Yeah, I think yeah. maybe he also, maybe he also liked Michael. Um, mm. It doesn't yeah. say he loves Michael, but mm. my sense is he liked Michael way more than he liked Vera. Yeah. And I think Paul, I mean, uh, Saul got a sense of that. Mm. 
And the Philistines gave him trouble anyway. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. were always mm -hmm. fighting against the Philistines, so it was kind of just a number this time or something, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not just it was a lot. Yeah. Why why do you think he if 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 the Hebrew text is correct, David brings back 200. Why? Why why double the number? <laughs> I'm gonna show you. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. just let's shut him up. I'm gonna show you. Up for a challenge. What'd you say, Julie? He was up for a challenge. <laughs> yeah. He was up for a challenge. That's right. Yeah. That, but it, there's something cool about this for me. When it came to Goliath, he was so, uh, what's the word, uh, different. Here, mm -hmm. he's much, much more proactive. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's, I, I mean, I don't know how afraid he was. I don't think he was afraid even with Goliath, probably a little crazy. But, uh, and I don't mean that in a, in a pejorative sense, mm -hmm. but, you know, he's a young man. Now he's got some years behind him, and he's getting a gradual sense, as Dale alluded to earlier, that there's something growing within him that makes him go, mm -hmm. if God wants me to do this, I can do this with God. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not that. simply that, you know, that he's the coming king of Israel. I, I mean, what I'm saying is it's not just this rear one in a thousand lives kind of thing. I mean, we all can have a sense of Maybe destiny is too strong a word, but purpose, mm -hmm. action, mm -hmm. cause, something. Mm -hmm. So you go for it because mm -hmm. there's a cause involved here. I'm not quite sure how it's going to play out, but I'm yeah. sure I'm on the right cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris, do we think that um, David knew what Saul was up to? You know, what the what Saul's motivation was? Well, or is he completely in the dark? But going for the 200 here could be saying, uh, you know, Laconius said, I'll throw you. I mean, yeah. he, he, it, that is a reasonable explanation of that. I yeah. don't really know. Yeah, yeah. Well, the fact that he's already been the target of, he's, he's already been target practice for Saul. Yeah, I mean he's he's got to be catching on here. David does that. Yeah. Yeah. Saul does not have my best interest in mind. Yeah, he's right. Right. Well, if he doesn't catch on, then he needs therapy. Because <laughs> yeah. I think I, I think it was last time we we, we, saw, we counted. There's six times I think that that uh, Saul tries to kill David between seventeen and twenty. So you know, at some point. You, you got to think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> getting wise. Yeah, yeah, getting wise. Um, trying to look at this text from the perspective of others, like from the perspective of Michael, Marib, the Philistine soldiers, the Philistine soldiers' families, and others. What what might you learn from those perspectives? Because we're we're just kind of looking at it from David right. and Saul's perspective. Yeah. Smart going is good for some of them. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's an interesting question. I mean, I think like the uh, series, The Chosen, that's mm -hmm. exactly what it's mm -hmm. doing, is taking secondary players in the story mm -hmm. and saying, let's look at the story of Jesus from their perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel bad for the Philistine soldiers' families. Yeah. But but on the on the other hand, um, at least from the storyteller's perspective here, um, the um, these people are part of the story that they have no idea they're part of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think that's often probably the human condition too mm -hmm. that we're part of a story that we have no idea we're a part of something bigger that's going on. Mm -hmm. right. Sometimes it's great and sometimes it's awful. Mm -hmm. I mean, in other words, something nefarious is going on and we're caught up in it. Yeah. But but sometimes it's, it's amazing. I, I think Michael pretty encouraged by it. I mean, yeah, she's gets, the exception. She gets the hero here and but no matter what happened, you know, I mean, if you're looking around and there's 
for a marriage, you know, for a husband partner out of the out of the people, the guy that just killed, you know, two hundred yeah. Philistines looks, so, you know, better than the farmer down the road. I mean, yeah. you know, he definitely is an up and comer, has yeah. prospects, all that good stuff. Um, it made for a better night than otherwise. Yeah, i I think she, you know, at least at this point of the game, you know, came out well. But I think Merib could have said, I could have had David. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So but, I got a, a whole fight. Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, you would think that perhaps the Philistines would fear God. I mean, you know, that that seems like that would be part of that story. Mm. Because here's this, here's this guy, David, who, who's coming in the name of the Lord and he keeps defeating us. Yeah. yeah. And, and doesn't it also echo the marrying the second one, not the first, not the prominent one or the firstborn female, but, you know, the hero marries the second right, one yeah, for yeah. various reasons? Yeah, yeah, it does feel like a, an repeat. echo of that. Yeah, yeah, repeat, yeah, yeah, replay. Um, okay, some, some questions there, really just to do on your own from uh, Stephen J. Vince's book, David Shepherd and King of Israel, which is a, a guide in Lectio Divina of the entire David story. So these, these are the questions that he wrote uh, reflecting, uh, to, to lead you to reflect more personally on this story. What is Saul's motive in offering his daughter to David in marriage? What might, be, might have been some of David's motives in marrying Michael? In what ways does the story of David and Michael demonstrate the nobility of love in the midst of intrigue? Which we didn't touch much on that, but Jonathan loves David. Michael loves David. What does that say about love in the midst of this strange story? And uh, what characteristics that David exhibits in this account would I like to imitate? Uh, in what aspect of my life can I emulate this trait? Uh, so we'll end it with that, unless anybody has a closing comment. Okay, great. We're very glad to have you guys online with us tonight. Good to see you guys. Thank you.